right. Well, we will get started this morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by introducing our speaker today, um, Mr. Gus Wright. Uh, Gus has been with the U.S. Army for 25 years and recently joined NV5 Geospatial, the organization that develops the NV software. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Gus for, I think, about 12 years. Um, Gus has been in the, like I mentioned, in the Army for 25 years and um, as a Chief Warrant Officer 5 in the geospatial uh, subject area. Um, he has a lot of experience with machine learning, um, spectral analysis. He has his master's degree from Penn State and um, has a great deal of experience of in theater um, working with geospatial data and analysis. So I think he has a lot to offer in terms of um, GR, um, GRSS, understanding the needs of the warfighter throughout the world. And I neglected to introduce myself. My name's Amanda O'Connor. Um, I'm also with NB5 Geospatial as a business development manager. i um, been working with hyperspectral data for about 25 years myself. And um, I'm the chair of the um, geospatial space or geosciences space borns imaging spectroscopy committee and Gus is also a co-chair on that committee so thank you very much um, and I see a note here that I can see your powerpoint in notes mode rather than slide mode so okay, let's see if we can I'll get do is I'll swap displays there we go there we cool go. so thank you uh, Craig uh, or Fergus I appreciate that and um, we'll get started. Okay, uh, Amanda, thanks for that introduction. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay before we get started. You guys can hear me okay? Thumbs up. Good to go. Okay. I think yeah. we're good. All right. Okay. Awesome. All right. So here's the topic, um, you know, and I'm definitely hoping that this will turn into a conversation rather than me just talking at you guys because that way, you know, we get things from this that we can go forward with and start to research, action, and and implement into uh, the work that's being done out and abroad. So here's here's sort of the journey that I see us going through for the next 35, 40 minutes or so, where I'll give you all an introduction to the, the topic and talk some about, you know, the importance, and then also uh, discuss some of the current challenges that we're, we're faced with in the armed services, me having just left about five months ago and still being connected with the men and women still serving. And then I'll, I'll talk about the uh, role that we see spectral science uh, playing in addressing some of these challenges and also solicit your feedback because, you know, we, we know what we don't know on, on the armed services side. That's why it's important for us to lean on the community to get input, best practices and workflows that'll help us along. And we'll discuss uh, some opportunities for collaboration, um, points of contact uh, that you could reach out to if you think you could help. And then uh, I'll, I'll introduce, you know, one particular case study, um, you know, where we applied some uh, spectral science to help us in one of the workflows in the Army um, that, that that was near and dear to me uh, when I spent some time with uh, with the NV software team back in 2016, 2017 timeframe. And uh, best practices. Uh, that we've seen. And as far as uh, questions and answers, uh, feel free to submit your questions throughout this uh, particular presentation. And I think Amanda's going to be monitoring the chat room and she'll uh, interrupt as needed and uh, throw those questions at me and I'll do my best to answer those questions and also take notes if I don't have answers to the questions so I can get back to you all. All right, now, um, Here's a, a chart that I'm going to spend a couple minutes on. All right, so uh, joint domain command and control um, It's a concept that the Department of Defense has developed to connect all the sensors from all the branches of all armed forces into a unified network. Okay, these branches, they include in the uh, lower right, they include the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Navy, as well as the uh, newly minted Space Force, right? So there's a challenge in of itself um, in terms of uh, interoperability, uh, data sharing, data formats. And the idea is to ensure that uh, we're able to um, maintain situational awareness of the sea, the land, the air, space, cyberspace, simultaneous, 
and potentially in multiple areas of, of operation, multiple regions across the globe. All right, so this becomes a challenge. And we see uh, spectral science playing a very critical role in supporting the armed services because it provides us with techniques for material and feature identification. All right, and uh, you know, the, the idea is to uh, develop workflows and make ensure that those workflows are repeatable. So automation is gonna be a huge component of that, right? And that's gonna help us with indications and warning systems uh, that, that'll keep us with a decisive advantage uh, when faced with whether it be a humanitarian assistance situation, disaster relief, or an actual combat scenario. So we wanna leverage spectral data and analysis uh, to, to gain insights, to address our challenges, and enhance the capabilities that we currently have, ultimately, bolstering our ability to uh, defend the nation. All right, some more um, detail concerning the importance. Okay, when, when considering material and feature identification, we need to have positive ID on whatever it is that we're, we're looking for. Um, so spectral science is gonna play a huge role. All modalities, um, you know, the best modality, will lean on the community for that, uh, depending on what the, the particular um, feature of interest may be. And, um, you know, obviously this uh, particular discussion is at the completely unclassified, unrestricted um, uh, level. So our contact information will be provided at the end if we wanna go into more detail. Uh, but we we ultimately want to enhance situational awareness so that we can have precision and accuracy when carrying out missions on the ground. And this is crucial for uh, mission success and also minimizing co collateral damage or unwanted harm uh, when we're doing the business that we're doing. Uh, automation is important because we need to be able to repeat said processes without having to reinvent the wheel, which led us up to the, the actual point of, of taking decisive action. So we need automation. It's a pivotal role. We're at the point now where we're, we're teaching our uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines uh, how to uh, do basic object-oriented programming um, so that they can do some things on their own. But we lean heavily on academia and the community to help out with that as well. And this is this allows for rapid response uh, in vital situations where where we need to be able to uh, you know exercise decision dominance is something that we we like to use as a term as of late exercise the ability to feed information to decision makers so they can make decisions at the pace of modern warfare indications and warnings are extremely important uh, when it comes to uh, making uh, decisions because we want to you know get ahead of things. All right, so early detections, uh, the use of our spectral sensors to enable us to identify threat actors or or someone doing something that goes against uh, conventional laws that allows us to be proactive in taking measures that that will continue to, to keep our, our troops safe and also to enable us to protect the, the homeland. All right, and, and it enhances our ability to, to anticipate, uh, you know, to do some, some uh some red hatting to see what we think might happen and model those situations as well. And in terms of, of joint target custody, uh, here lies a, a challenge, all right? Because uh, co collaboration and coordination between services is extremely important because sometimes we don't have uh, visibility from one sensor or the next or, or one source of uh, information or the next. So we have to rely on one or, or another to maintain vis visibility on something that we may be, be looking for uh, among the different branches. As I spoke of earlier, uh, the combination, combining of sensors across all services uh, is one way that we think we, we will be able to accomplish this, right? And this will ensure seamless sharing of features of interest information, optimizing our resources and allocations so that we're not wasting uh, resources uh, on one service or the, or the other. And we're, we're actually tasking our sensors properly to maintain custody of something for the duration of time that we need to have eyes on it. Current challenges. Here's where I can see us truly leaning on uh, the scientific community and also leaning on um, academia. Right. And what I like to do is try to completely avoid thinking traps. And what I mean by that, I'm quite sure all of you have uh, have watched TV or the, listened to the radio and hear a ton of talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, 
And I, I truly think that most people don't have a clue about what they're saying when they say some of those things, because, uh, you know, we realize that that's not the answer to every one of our problems. So we want to be able to allow the subject matter experts within the, the field in the realm of, of spectral science to make the determination of what workflow, what best practice applies best to what it is that we're trying to do. Right. And obviously we want to be able to repeat those um, through uh, automation and data convergence becomes an issue. You know, data formats, how do we converge all different types of data when necessary to be able to answer the questions that we have? Right. And then also there's one thing that I would say keeps me up will be the uh, cognitive data laws. And what I mean by that is, you know, there, there are thousands of analysts across the force um, doing things, you know, making discernments, uh, heads up digitizing, uh, doing a literal analysis on imagery. Um, in some cases, not maximizing um, the full capability of all the spectral uh, data that, that's available within said imagery, uh, not maximizing uh, all, all the bands and, and the uh, best practices that are available to us with the, uh, with the software, the sophisticated software that we have at, at our disposal. And in my opinion, um, I, I truly think that uh, we are not capturing all those discernments properly because I can see that as tagged information that could potentially help us if we uh, needed to do uh, deep learning or machine learning uh, to repeat some of some of the, the workflows that we're doing. Uh, but there's not an efficient way um, in place right now to to capture all of that work that's being done so that it can be reusable for the purpose of training a model or or uh or, or an object detector and uh we will lean on the community and and industry to help us out with that and feature of interest custody or target custody um that's a challenge within itself uh you know that process of maintaining eyes on something and being able to say you know where it's at where it might potentially go or where did it go uh, that that is a challenge within itself and you know we lean on the community to to uh help us with thoughts and ideas best practices modalities on how to actually get after that problem set and hopefully we'll get some of that from this how we see the role of spectral science and addressing these challenges, uh, the, the workflows and the techniques. Uh, what are the best workflows and techniques to do some of the things that was discussed? You know, spe spectral science is going to play a, a critical role in addressing these challenges uh, faced by the armed services in, in several ways. Uh, for instance, material and target identification, okay, utilizing spectral analysis techniques to accurately identify materials and targets uh, even in complex environments or, or in situations where uh, people are trying to disguise or, or spoof or put decoys out, um, we can see that as a way that spectral science can actually help us to address uh, some of our problems and enhances our ability to differentiate, differentiate between friend or foe uh, and also reduces the risk of, of friendly fire incidents so that we can actually identify one another in our operating spaces. Another way that we can see spectral science helping us will be uh, automation. Implementing spectral science and automation processes can help us to streamline data analysis. It'll improve uh, the speed at which our decision makers can make decisions. And in some cases, uh, we can automate all the way out to the decision if it's a, a, a confidence inter interval that we can, we can live with. It also reduces the amount of human error that might take place. OK, enhancing the efficiency of reconnaissance is another way that we see uh, spectral science helping us uh, with surveillance situations, uh, uh, feature of interest acquisition tasks through automated spectral data processes. And we also can see the indications and warnings uh, being enhanced by spectral analysis by leveraging sensors for early detection of threats, enabling timely indications and warnings to be issued so that we can take uh, proactive action. We also see an enhancing uh, sensitivity and, and speci specificity uh, between sensors to determine which modality uh, can detect subtle changes in spectral signature that may indicate potential th threats. So these are things that will de definitely increase uh, combat effectiveness for our, our warfighters. In terms of the uh, the joint 
custody. This is a, a challenge, as I mentioned before. Facilitating interoperability is something we see that the community could really help us with, uh, you know, um, because information sharing am among different branches of the armed service and allied forces through standard spectral data formats is hugely important. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out uh, which what is the best 3D format for us uh, and image formats, you know, SICKET data, other types of formats that are out there. We need to have some sort of standards so that, you know, we understand what we're looking at and we can rapidly ingest and output information so that decision makers can uh, can be lethal when they need to be and also make decisions, uh, you know, to handle humanitarian situations when needed. It improves coordination and collaboration and, and joint operations by providing common spectral science frameworks uh, for, for us to be able to execute workflows that enable us to keep eyes on uh, something when we need to maintain custody of it. And by harnessing the power of spectral science, uh, armed services can overcome challenges related to uh, I identifying something positively, automating our workflows for indication and warnings, and maintaining custody. And ultimately, it improves our, our operational effectiveness. So this is something that we'll, we'll lean heavily um, on venues like this to help us with so that we can get papers or even workflows and research to, to follow up uh, and actually put into testing scenarios and then and ultimately implement into the way that we fight. Okay, concerning opportunities to collaborate, okay, I like to boil things down to simple questions, okay? Okay, simple answers to simple questions. That's all the warfighter needs concerning um, uh, keeping custody of a target or something like that, okay? Is it a positive ID? You know, that's this is if you feel like you can help answer questions like that, uh, you have points of contact below. Myself and uh, and Dr. Terry are currently in works with uh, the Army Joint Battalion uh, to help them with similar workflows as discussed. And also, if you can answer questions like where are where are they now, and where did they come from? These are questions that, uh, believe it or not, uh, can be a struggle sometimes uh, at the pace of modern warfare. And automation is critical. So if you can help answer questions like that, those are points of contact that you can reach out to. And then uh, we can discuss, and especially if you if you have the uh, ability to enter cleared spaces, if you have a clearance, uh, we can definitely use your help and, and your thoughts and ideas on how we can get after said problem sets. And collaboration will be key going forward. Here's an example case study of a uh, how we've applied spectral science uh, in the Army in the past. Uh, around 2012, I was working with the uh, 60th Geospatial Planning Cell out of Europe, and I noticed that we were uh, doing uh, heads-up digitizing 100% uh, to produce authoritative uh, terrain features for the purpose of creating topographic line maps. And mainly we were using uh, we were using panchromatic images and it was all done by hand. And the workflow uh, was similar to what you see here. A uh, soldier would check out a map. They would heads up digitize for weeks on end uh, to pull out all the features that were necessary for map finishing. And then at step three, the uh the information would end up with a data steward who would usually find egregious error uh error on top of error and it is it was it created a backlog at at step four pushing information through uh the the geospatial analysis integrity tool uh, that NGA produced that actually tested data for schema topo, topo, topography errors and then it pushes it into the authoritative goal set. So this was a really clunky workflow um, to say the least. And uh, myself and a couple colleagues got together and did some research and it ultimately uh, led me uh, to, to Penn State where, where I actually was able to get deep into the research. And we were able to, we were able to whittle the workflow down to what you see here. Um, and it was a uh, the application of some Python algorithms and uh, TensorFlow, not H2O. H2O ended up not working well for us. And we were able to uh, standardize the workflow. Uh, there was a lot less subjectivity. And then we were able to streamline uh, the production of, of features by doing some autonomous feature extraction. So that's one workflow that worked for us. And we ended up uh, uh, making use of random forest algorithms uh, were, were the ones that worked out the best for us. And the test was... Uh, 
initially done on just simple trees and water just to prove that it can be done. And I'm quite sure you guys have seen uh, more advanced techniques um, since then. Uh, this was carried out. It was completed in 2017. So that's one workflow uh, that we've used uh, in the armed services by uh, applying artificial uh, neural networks uh, to the problem set. And that may not be the answer going forward. We want to avoid thinking traps and thinking that um, AI is the answer to every problem that we have. And we lean on the community to look at the questions, the simple questions, and come up with the most, um, the mo the most efficient solution and share that with us so we can go forward and do the things that we need to do. Okay, now in conclusion, these are the things that we covered. Okay, we did a quick introduction, talked about the challenges that we face um, and what we think the role of spectral science will be in addressing said challenges. And obviously there's opportunities to collaborate. Uh, my information is available to you and we can share that again uh, if necessary before we close this out. And then we also talked about the case study, uh, one case study of many that, that we've done in the Army. Um, so now I'd like to open up to see if there are any questions, um, Amanda, that I could uh, answer for the group. I uh, think you're muted, Amanda. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if any, thank you guys for that presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. I've got a couple to get us started. Um, you know, Gus, what do you think has been most important in your learning of how to apply spectral data to the problems that warfighters face? I think the most important thing um, for for us would would be um, to ensure that we're taking the most efficient approach understanding what data is available to us and what tools that we have to exploit said data. And more importantly, knowing what the question is, uh, because I think uh, too often uh, we, we've, had, um, we've had our end users and our end users on the, the Department of Defense side is usually a decision maker, someone who's in command or in charge of something. Uh, we've had those guys sometimes come to us uh, um, and jump past giving us what the problem is and asking for specific things. Uh, you know, and to give an example, you would never go to the doctor and say, hey, I need an EKG, I need a CAT scan, you would give symptoms. So understanding the question is the most important thing to us and then understanding what data and what tools that we have and then educating our decision makers uh, to help us to, uh, to help them to identify where there's where there are knowledge gaps that we can help them with, help them to learn to ask as poignant uh, spectrally and geospatially related questions. That's the most important thing. Great, thank you. We have a question from the chat. Uh, for 3D representation, are you applying any fusion techniques apart from hyperspectral with panchromatic? Um, not that I know of for, for the particular problem set that we have. Um, and if you know of ways, by all means, uh, share that with us um, because we, we have the ways that we're trying. And again, I'll go back to those uh, collaboration slides. We have ways that we're trying um, and obviously they're being done in cleared spaces. So if you are cleared, um, we can talk some more about it and uh, hopefully collaborate with you if there's a better way of getting after the problem set. But we are using video as well as uh, imagery to get after it. Thank you. And we have another question from Andre uh, Friedman uh, from Norsk Electro Optic, which I think is high spec, um, produces the high spec camera. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. You described working with uh, spectral data as identifying various spectral signatures. Is the technique called anomaly detection usable for your applications? Yes, it is. And uh, we, we are applying anomaly detection, um, uh, but we haven't found ways to um, identify everything efficiently that we're interested in. So some things are easily to identify in that way, you know, applying principles of autocorrelation, you know, if something just doesn't belong in that region, you know, we can pick it out. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need to go on a case by case basis. You know, one feature, um, one technique may work really well for, but not for the next, if that makes sense. Thank you. 
Um, I'm just reading the next question. Um, Thank you. Um, so this question is from Peter Konstat. Uh, this question is not related to optical remote sensing. Sorry, that's okay. We we we, <laughs> we work with SAR too. Um, but I wonder if you know anything about using the recently commercially available high resolution SAR data, such as Umbra, um, to monitor and detect minefields in Ukraine. I wonder if the surface displacement of large minefields would be detectable. And I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah, oh, we, we are using some of that data. Um, and as far as minefields, we haven't tried to do it um, for, for that particular. So if there are workflows that you know that may work, um, you know, by all means, please share. And that just may mean I haven't been involved. Perhaps there's someone else in the community that has, uh, but I particularly haven't been involved with minefield detection. But SAR is definitely uh, something in our toolkit uh, that that we're we're leveraging to get after some of our problem sets. Thank you, and I'll just add on there, uh, Peter, in speaking with um, some representatives from Umbra Space. Um, you can do some coherent change detection with um, their constellation. Um, I'm not aware of, of work being done in Ukraine, but if you'd like a connection, I can certainly provide that to you. And I'll put my uh, contact information in the chat. Absolutely. And then another question just uh, for you, Gus. Um, you know, the remote sensing community is really diverse. Um, you know, what have you had experience in collaborating with other parts of the remote sensing community, like environmental scientists or um, geologists or um, just another area that's not necessarily war, you know, warfighter specific that yeah. has impacted your knowledge? Yeah, we we have, um, particularly during the um, COVID-19 uh, there was a lot of collaboration between um, uh, the group I was working with uh, at, at INSCOM. That's the Intelligence and Securities Command. I think it's what it stands for. Uh, we, we were working with the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who does a lot of environmental work and a lot of work with conservation and preserving aquifers. And uh, we, we learned a whole lot, a whole lot during that time. And uh, we were a part of the, the COVID-19 task force. Uh, with with looking at you know how how it spreads was it airborne was it getting in the water we were looking at tons of stuff uh, but that that was very informative and I'm sure we could probably learn a lot from that community um, and taking workflows that are applicable to their problem sets and then uh, you know doing tweaks that we ha may have to um, to apply those to to problem sets that the warfighters face with so that's a a good point thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Thank you for your response. Um, you know, and 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 following on to that, you know, we had our recent um, GRSS at administrative meeting, and um, there was some statistics shown on the this group in terms of the the membership of it, and you know, it's largely research, academic, some government, um, but you know, military. Um, membership is, is rather small. How do you think that organizations like this can better influence or better support the armed services community? Is it direct engagement like this, like a discussion, or is it, um, you know, sitting, sitting down one-on-one -on -one and, and the groups coming together? Like, what, what do you think is the best way for us to kind of exchange ideas? I think the best way is education. Um, we have centers of excellence. Um, there's the uh, Intelligence Center of Excellence at Fort Huachuca, who uh, trains our uh, imagery intelligence analysts. And then there's also the Maneuver Support Center of Excellence at Fort Leonard Wood, who trains our geospatial engineers. Now, I think those are opportunities um, because, uh, you know, we're resource constrained. You know, we the, the services uh, struggle just like everyone else when it comes to resource allocation. And, you know, we split our training, um, all centers of excellence sp split it into three domains, which is the, um, the self-development domain, 
the institution, which is the center of excellence itself. And then also there's the uh, operational environment. So we know that a soldier or sailor or airman, so to speak, um, can only receive 33% of what he or she needs to know at the institution, 33% on wow. the job training, and then about 33% self-development if they're a go-getter, if they can sign up for college. So if they're opportunities, uh, training workshops that are made available to the services. I'm sure you get a lot of people um, that that will be eager to take advantage of that for the simple fact that we know we don't know what we need to know to do everything, you know, and um, and being able to to educate folks um, beyond what they get at the schoolhouse and on the job is uh, is something that will really be beneficial. Great. Thank you. So we have another question from Andre, um, follow up to his earlier one. Um, the efficiency of the anomaly detection techniques heavily depends on the quality of acquired hyperspectral data, such as spatial co-registration. Um, the wavelengths uh, for a single spatial pixel come from the same area on the ground. May this be a reason why anomaly detection didn't work well for some targets, likely smaller targets with small details are problematic with low co quality cameras. Definitely. It's definitely a reason. And sometimes we don't always have time to even deal with hyperspectral data um, because uh, a lot of the work that's being done on the DOD side is time sensitive and uh, tracking down a sensor that, that uh, that's even collecting hyperspectral and then processing it can be uh, time consuming. And those, those, those minutes, hours, or even days, they, they matter in some scenarios. Now, if they're smarter ways to pre-process and get, get hyperspectral information, I'm all ears. Uh, and I'd, I'd be more than happy to learn and share that with the rest of the community. Thank you. And we have another uh, question from Peter. Um, I do also have an optically related question. Much like the field boundary detection in agriculture, I assume the US military has systems that can daily scan a front line from high resolution fusion data of optical or SAR to identify Russian vehicles like MLRS, MBTs, et cetera. As such, I would assume it would be possible to build a system that can daily count the number and category of current enemy vehicles from a t for military intelligence and estimate the strength of enemy forces. Yeah, and uh, help. <laughs> if you can help to facilitate that, then I think you'll be helping us to solve some of our problems. Yeah, I think a lot of that is data availability is really probably a limiting factor in that. I mean, yeah, you have optical and SAR can penetrate through clouds, see at night, but the resolution of such, I mean, yes, you have some high resolution SAR cameras and you have high resolution optical cameras, but getting data every day, um, you know, the footprints of some of those are, are you know, think about a, a Maxar, um, a Maxar, uh, what, why is this escaping me? Um, Worldview three, you know, yeah. it's about 11 by 11 kilometers. And if you're trying to look at, you know, an entire battlefront, um, you're not going to get that on a daily basis. I mean, you can combine high resolution sensors like Airbus, um, Maxar, others, but it, it, you're right. It does become kind of a fusion issue of, of getting all of this data together and being able to analyze to detect those specific objects that you're talking about. And I know that, you know, there's been some recent calls for um, object detection work from the NGA and other um, uh, DOD organizations. So I think this is still a very active field of research. It is. And yes. yeah. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Cause. No, you, you're on it. It's, it's active and uh, accuracy is extremely important to us. And, you know, fusing multiple uh, platforms, you know, it depends on angles. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the earth doesn't sit still in terms of uh, movement on it. So we just have to be really careful about duplicating counts, things like that. If, if we're fusing multiple anger angles and, and azimuths, if something's nadir, off nadir or, or oblique, 
uh, we want to make sure that we're counting things once and not multiple times so that when we're doing things like ground order of battle and determining how many is in a, a fleet that we're, we're accurate, accurate with that. And so um, it's a challenge and, and I'll, I'll definitely, you know, be interested in knowing if someone is, is uh, able to offer up an idea or ideas that could help with those challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Patrick Rouse made the comment, you know, the biggest problem is the lack of spectral, a spectral library that contains all the materials you might encounter as opposed to the spectra of the things you are looking for. Without accounting for the confuser materials, you'll always have a high false alarm rate. Yes. Um, I, I, you know, I, yeah, I don't, do you have any comments there, Gus? No, no comments. That's a spot on, uh, uh, you know, statement. You know, that that's why uh, I discussed earlier, you know, people spoofing or putting decoys out, you know, that's always a concern as you, you're not dealing with insurgencies anymore. We're, we're looking at, um, you know, near peer adversaries who, uh, you know, who, who, who can actually have uh, air superiority in some cases uh, to, to match ours. So they'll have fake aircraft out there, you know, that, that may throw us off and other things on the ground. So we have to be really uh, cognizant that sometimes there are decoys and we need to use everything within our toolkit to determine whether something's real or not. Right. Yeah, I. that's that's spot on what I would think as well. I mean, is you have a toolkit. You can't always just say, you know, we're, we're going to take this path to, to find this and you have to be creative. And then that's one of the things I've always respected about you, Gus, is you... You, you've built your toolkit over the years. You've learned how to code. You've learned how to use multiple different soft, software applications to solve problems and really, you know, reached out uh, to, to branch out your skills. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily like I think you said earlier, the go-getters who, who do that kind of work are the ones who can solve problems fast and efficiently. Um, and yeah, I've, I've always had a great deal of respect for, for the work that you've put in to, to advancing your career in that direction. Oh, much appreciation. You know, and I've, I've learned a ton from yourself and Adam and other folks on the team. And, uh, which is why I can't say enough, um, that training opportunities for the warfighter is extremely helpful because just as we discussed, uh, myself being able to spend that year with uh, the Envy software team, well, that's just one guy from, you know, the entire army and everyone doesn't get those opportunities. So if there are opportunities, uh, that can be presented workshops, even if it's virtual, I'm quite sure you'll get a high particip participation rate. And furthermore, we'll, we'll get, um, you know, some skills out there that can be applied against the problems that we have. Yeah. Can you tell the, the group a little bit about that program? So Gus uh, spent a year with um, the, the NB software development team. Um, and, you know, can you just explain kind of that program and how the Army interacts with commercial companies like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, around 2011, the Army uh, reinvigorated what they call the Training with Industry program for uh, some fields. Well, and my field was uh, at the time geospatial engineering. And uh, I was the uh, second um, person to go. Uh, first, The first guy, guy by the name of CW5, Eric Reed, he went and spent a year with uh, ESRI. And then uh, right after that, uh, they sent me to spend time with uh, with the Envy software team in Boulder, Colorado. And the Army recognized that, um, you know, sometimes you have to leave the Army in order to get the, the knowledge needed uh, to advance your tradecraft. And that program was put in place for that reason. So I left the Army, spent a year, uh, even though I was still uh, an active duty member, um, I got to wear civilian clothes and hang out with smart people. Uh, like Amanda and and other folks on the Envy software team, and I was able to uh, to learn some things uh, concerning uh, you know other approaches to analysis, uh, computational thinking uh, rather than just buttonology, and uh, it it was very informative for me. Um, and I after that year, I was sent to the Maneuver Center of Excellence to teach uh, uh, geospatial engineering for for uh, four years, uh, three and a half years. And uh, there uh, was when um, I, I started to get things incorporated into our curriculum, such as object-oriented programming, uh, some more spectral uh, analytics. 
uh, and also um, uh, in, including uh, some of the uh, curriculum uh, for for from Penn State as well that coupled up with that to help me with some of our my research. But it was a, it's a great program. It's still going to this day. I think there have been uh, two or three others after me to go through the program at uh, at with the Envy Software team. And if the Army's smart, they'll continue that program because uh, the capabilities that they get from that are um, irreplaceable, and you can't put a, a dollar amount on what that does for a soldier and then that soldier returns back to the force and and you know prolif proliferates that knowledge uh to all the people that he or she uh, is able to work with and lead mentor or work for yeah it, it was a great experience you know from the commercial side to learn from Gus um to help us improve the products that we create um, and really get that firsthand knowledge. And I, I think that's an excellent program for any of you who, um, you know, work in the commercial industry. Um, Gus can provide you with information on on how to how to work with the Army if, if, if that's an opportunity um, that is feasible um, within your community. So, yeah, that was a uh, it was a really great program. Um, one final question, um, you know, we. Uh, we touched a little bit on high resolution SARD and hyperspectral. We know that there's a lot of small sats coming. We know that there's a lot of multispectral small sats. Is what do you think is going to be like the most important modality, or is it just a fusion of data that's really going to be the best tools for the warfighter to access yeah, in the, the next couple of years? Yeah, I would say as, as far as the warfighter goes, the warfighter is always going to be modality and software agnostic, more concerned with the answer uh, than anything, because, you know, they're high stakes and winning is, you know, the bottom line uh, when it comes to the warfighter. So whatever modality is needed to get the answer to those simple questions and, you know, just so happens this slide is still up, you know, is it a positive ID? Where are they now and where did they come from? Where might they go? Simple questions like that. So if that modality can answer the question, it's going to be the best one for us. So it, it more likely what you said, a fusion or um, uh, uh, a tandem usage of multiple to get after the answers that we need. Yep, that, that makes perfect sense. And that was one of the things like when I've done training uh, with the Marine Corps, um, is you know the question gets <laughs> comes down it gets asked it's like it's all hands on deck on how do we solve this problem and what skills can we have and um so yeah your comments on training are very um very salient in terms of having that knowledge so that people can actually solve the problem quickly and produce a result that's accurate um and can be used so absolutely um, any other questions um, before we wrap up? Okay. Well, Haley, thank you so much for uh, being our Zoom guide today. Uh, Gus, thank you so much for your presentation and your time and knowledge. We appreciate you sharing it with this community. It was a uh, this will be on the GRSS webpage. Um, if anybody wants to watch it or forward on to their, their colleagues. And... Um, I said I would put my email in the chat as well, which let me do that now. There we go. And we will wrap up for today and thank you everyone for your time.